I'm Bruce Slavin. This will con- be the continuation of our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we've been looking at Acts, and tonight we will start by looking at chapter 6 of the book of Acts. So in those days, when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We can see that the church has started to become organized. They knew how many people were saved, and about this time there was a figure that was close to 20,000 people. They knew where to meet and what time to meet. They had also collected many goods and food and was able to distribute that. Uh, but in sin had been confronted with it, Ananias and Sapphira. But organization did not mean there were no issues. We see an issue starting to come up in the church. So let's look at who are these people? Who is the Hellenistic Jews? During the, uh, when Babylon conquered Israel and Ju- Judah, they dispersed the Jewish people throughout the world, throughout the known world, that it would be. And so these Jews, while they were dispersed, they still carried along with their customs. So if you look at them, if you look at a Hellenistic Jew, how they differed from a Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking Jew. They spoke in Greek. Um, They used the Septuagint, which was the Greek version of the Old Testament, versus the Hebrew Aramaic version that was used by the Palestinian Jews. They also, um, the Hellenistic Jews, had accepted some of the cultures of the uh, Greek-speaking people. And this greatly disturbed many of the Palestinian Jews, and especially the Pharisees. In fact, the Pharisees considered the Hellenistic Jews to be second-class citizens. Now, we know that Hebrew and Hellenistic were mere titles, but one thing we were to know for sure that these people were all believers in Jesus Christ. Um, excuse me, I'm trying to get this computer to go up. Um, But many, you know, why were there a number of Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem? Well, if you remember, it all started with the Pentecost. Pentecost was a big festival, and because it was a big festival, Jews came from all over the world to celebrate these festivals. While they were there, they heard Peter speak at the great sermon of Pentecost, and there were over 3,000 saved. And later, after the healing of the the lame uh, beggar, another 2,000. Now, these were just men. So as I mentioned, when you added all the women and the fact that there were new converts being added daily, it was an estimated 20,000 people were now believers. Because the number, as I mentioned, a lot of these came from uh, outside of Judea to Jerusalem to celebrate. There were a large number there. And of these converts, I'm sure a good number of them were these Hellenistic Jews. Now, the problem came up is that the Hellenistic group of Jews felt that their widows were being neglected, that they weren't getting their fair share of food. And this was causing a big controversy, a controversy that if not settled soon, could cause a major split in the, in the church. Remember last week we talked about... Uh, how a church is, can be destroyed, rarely, if ever, a church is destroyed externally. We see history, through history, every time there's persecution, churches can tend to continue and flourish. But internal strife is what kills a church. And here was the opportunity for Satan to get a, uh, a hold by destroying this church. So what could they do? Well, they turned to the apostles and said, hey, what can we do? So the apostles, the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who you have known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and they gave our, and we will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the responsibility to come up with a solution fell on these twelve. And their solution was, they went to the congregation as a whole and said, you select seven men, seven men who are quite worthy, who have wisdom, have knowledge. 
So <clears throat> now let's look at the word the weight on tables. Now the word a table in the Greek is trapeza. Trapeza means either table or counter of money changer or money matters, as well as can be called an eating table, meaning they not only took care of the food, but the money as well. Finally, in verse 4, we notice that the apostles will devote their attention to prayer and ministry. These two are inseparable. Prayer must permeate a pastor's sermon preparation. You know, I've got to know David uh, in the times he's been here, and I can tell you without any doubt that David is a man of prayer. He believes in prayer. He prays his sermons. He prays for you after his sermons. So <clears throat> in it, from there, in verses 5 through 7, it says, This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of faith of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timian, Permis, and Nicholas from Antioch, a con convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the uh, to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them, so that the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient. You know, the interesting thing is when you look at these names, these are all Greek names. So all the men they chose were Greek speaking. It's kind of odd that when you look at the church that the majority was Aramaic uh, speaking Jews, but in this case they chose Greek speaking Jews. And so you also notice that they laid hands on them. This is something, if you go to a deacon ordination, you will see the deacons lay hands on the new deacons to be ordained. Now, nowhere in the book of Acts do we see the word deacon. But most consider that uh, these guys were the first to fill the office as described in 1 Timothy 3. Now, what was the immediate result of appointing these men to assist the apostles? That there were many believers... Uh, a large number begin to believe in Jesus Christ because now they were free, the, the apostles were free to go spread the word. So now let's look at Stephen. In Acts 6, through, 6, 8 through 10, it says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Now let's stop there. That's kind of interesting because you know, we, we see where the apostles were granted the ability to do many signs and many wonders and in some, in some cases, some very devout men, such as Stephen, were able to do the same signs and wonders that the apostles were doing. In verse 9, we said, Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freemen, as they called it, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. So who exactly were these synagogue of the freemen? Well, first of all, there were close to 480 synagogues in Jerusalem. These synagogues were divided by maybe ethnicity, maybe by language, maybe by family, by different beliefs. The freemen themselves were descendants of Jewish slaves captured by Pompey in 63 BC and carried back to Rome. Later they were freed, and some of them decided to migrate back to Jerusalem. Stephen's, we don't know if sure who was up, we just know he was Greek-speaking, was possibly a member of the Freedmen Synagogue. As in all synagogues, synagogues the, the attendees were encouraged to speak, and I'm sure Stephen began to speak about Jesus. And I'm sure this, as you can see in the verses, seemed to infuriate the members, and they were not, but they were not able to be, debate against him. Why were they able to debate against him? Because the Spirit was talking, not Stephen. And we'll see this in a little bit some verses. It says, Then, in verses 11 through 14, Then they secretly persuaded, persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. Now that's important. Remember, they said teachers of the law. They stirred up this time, they stirred up the Pharisees. Remember, in the last week when we looked at the trial, the Pharisees were not necessarily going along with the Sadducees that they needed to put to death the apostles. So, because they, they just said, hey, let's wait and see what happens. 
You know, if these men are of God, you don't want to fight God. But now, because there's these false accusations, the Pharisees get stirred up. So as they, they stirred up the people and elders in the church, elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin is a council of both the Sadducees and Pharisees. It says they produced false witnesses who testified this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. So we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazarene will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. This sounds a whole lot like what the, uh, the Pharisees did to Jesus. These guys, these freedmen, could not uh, argue, debate uh, Stephen. So as a result, they went and found some men who would take a bribe to falsely accuse Stephen of blasphemy. Um, and so with these false, you know, these uh, accusers, and, and Stephen, uh, the synagogue took uh, Stephen towards the, Sen uh, the Sanhedrin uh, to be trialed. Now, I'm sure, as before, the Sadducees were anxious to see the persecution, they, well, the, actually the end of uh, the, this talk about Jesus Christ. And here was their opportunity, because now the Pharisees were willing to join them. And it concludes in, in verse 16, it says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. You know, God himself answered their false charges by putting his glory on Stephen's face. You know, this glory was a face of, of peace. But more important is, is that something experienced by no other person in history except Moses had this face. And, I, you know, you can imagine what these people in the Sanhedrin are looking at Stephen, hoping to intimidate him, hoping possibly to put him to death, yet they could see a total peace on his face. So let's turn over to chapter 7 now. And so when the high priest asked Stephen, are these ch charges true? Now let's think of what was Stephen being accused of. He was accused of four things. He, was, he, spoke, he speaks against God or blasphemies God, he blasphemes Moses, he blasphemes the law, he blasphemes the temple. So all these things, you know, there was nothing left to, to accuse him of. I mean, they basically threw the book at him. At this point, I cannot help but what Jesus said in Luke 12, 11. It says, when, you bring, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers, the authorities do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour and what you ought to say. So Stephen goes fully armed with the Holy Spirit. Um, so what is he about to face himself, you know, defend himself before the gospel? You know, I wrestled with going through all these verses at first. I thought, well, this is really just history. But when you look at it, it's more than history. Stephen uses the Old Testament, which, of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees accepted. Well, we know the Sadducees only accepted the first five verses, but he's, I mean, first five chapters of the Old Testament, but he stayed pretty much over there. He does speak some in Psalms and some other verses, but, you know, when I looked at it, is it necessary? But he uses what a term called apologetics. Apologetics is a form of defense. If you remember... Uh, a good friend of mine named Elijah Abraham, he's been at our church to speak. He talks about apologetics, that you need to know the Bible in order to defend the faith. And this is exactly what Stephen did. So he begins his, his defense. Um, and let's look again at 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, Reverend Christ is Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So again, Stephen did this. He was, uh, he was prepared to speak not only in his behalf, but he was on to speak on Jesus' behalf. Um, now, I'm not sure, especially at the end, he treats the Sanhedrin with great you know, gentleness and respect. What he does do is turn the tables on the accusers and the Sanhedrin. Stephen basically tells them they are the blasphemers, not him. At this point, Stephen gives a panorama of the Old Testament history beginning with Abraham.
So at this point begins a history of the Old Testament beginning with Abraham. So he talks about, they talked about blaspheming against God. Stephen's first offense is against the acquisition that he blamed blaspheming God. In verse 2, Stephen says, The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham. Now Stephen acknowledges that God is the God of Israel. He established God as who he is revealed in the scriptures as the Jews believe. He is the God who called Israel into existence. So let's look at that word glory. Do you know how many times this title appeared in the Old Testament? Believe it or not, it's only once. In Psalm 29, it says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in his splendor and his holiness. The voice of the Lord twist, and, uh, twist the oaks and strip the forest bare. And his temple all cried glory. The Sanhedrin's knew this verse. And they knew that, that Stephen nowhere blaspheming God. Also notice that Stephen said, Our father... He didn't say, my father, your father. He's saying, I am one of you. He is my father too. I'm not a blasphemer of God, nor am I a traitor to Israel. I'm not blaspheming the God of glory. Finally, I'd like to point out one thing. Um, when Stephen said the God of glory appealed to our father Abraham, he was making it clear that God appeared to Abraham and guided Abraham and blessed him at Abraham when there was no temple. This is important to see this because we'll see this in every one of his arguments. There was no temple that was at that time. So now let's look at it. Also, he turned to Joseph. Beginning in verse 8, he, uh, he turned from Joseph, I mean, Abraham to Joseph. This is significant because Joseph's life parallels the life of Jesus. Let's look at verse 9. Because the patriots were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him. Joseph had been set up part by God for a special blessing. The birthright belongs to Joseph. Let's look at what it said in 1 Chronicles 5.1. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was the firstborn, but when he defiled his father's marriage bed, his rights as firstborn were given to the sons of Joseph, son of Israel. So he cannot be listed in the geological record in accordance with his birthright. The brothers, 10 of the 12 tribes, were blasphemers because the scripture said the birthright belonged to Joseph. They went against God. They were sinful men. They were proud. They were rebellious. They blasphemed God by selling the chosen one into slavery. Like Joseph, Jesus was rejected by the Jewish people. Like Joseph, Christ was sent to the pit to die. Unlike Joseph, Jesus died. He was restored by God and will come again to redeem his people. You know, basically... Stephen is saying, you people have a habit of rejecting saviors God sends you. Why don't you wake up and stop rejecting Jesus? Again, he says, but God was this him. There was no temple for, for Joseph. So the temple was not an easy. So now he's turned to the argument he turns to Moses because he was accused of blaspheming Moses. It says, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Moses, the number of people in Egypt had already increased. So what do you think he meant when, when Stephen said, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Moses? Remember, he promised Moses he would have a great nation. So where was this great nation? It was in slavery in Egypt. So he was talking about who was the leading, who was the lead the people out of Egypt, out of bondage to the promised land. That was Moses. Moses is the next picture of Jesus, who was favored by God from birth. Remember, he was saved as a child when uh, the queen of the Pharaoh, um, or the daughter, I'm sorry, the daughter of the Pharaoh saved Moses from the reeds. Um, it says he was miraculously served, preserved in childhood and was said to be, and said to be in verse 22, powerful in speech and action. We see Moses protecting his people, yet he was rejected by the people in verse 29. But the man who mistreating the others pushed Joseph aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? They did not want Moses as their liver, as they rejected Moses, as they rejected Joseph and Jesus. Israel blasphemed Moses, therefore blaspheme of God. They blasphemed God because Moses was God's chosen person. So Moses leaves, and it's 40 years later that Moses returns to deliver his people. 
After 40 years, God appears to Moses in a burning bush. Uh, again, this points to the fact that God's pres presence is not limited to the temple. God is bigger than the temple, and Moses does not need the temple to be close to God. So let's look at verse 37. This is, Moses, this, this is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will rise you up, a prophet like me, from your own people. Who was this prophet? It was Jesus. And the Sanhedrin knew who Stephen was referring to, yet they still uh, failed to accept Jesus. The third charge against Stephen was he blasphemed against the law. In Acts 7.38, he was in the assembly in the wilderness, and the angels who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our ancestors, he received living word to pass it on. Stephen says the law was given to angels to Moses. I thought it was odd that the Sanhedrin did not accept angels as real, but again, in this case, he brings up angels. It said, it is a living word. It lives forever. Jesus said not one speck of that law will ever pass away until it's fulfilled. Stephen understood that God was the author of the law. Angels were mediators, and Moses was a recipient. Jesus, I'm sorry, Stephen was not a blasphemer of the law. Finally, let's look at the temple. The final accusation was that he blasphemed the temple. So we'll read here several verses in Acts 7, 39 through 43. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods that will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifice to it and revealed in that, uh, in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings, forty years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacles of Molech and the star of your god, Rephan, and the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Babylon. So the people of Israel continued to reject Moses. They turned their back. They wanted to turn back to Egypt and to make a golden calf. Again, Stephen did not speak against the temple the way the people worshipped the temple. See, they were worshipping the temple made by their own hands. The temple had become an idol to them. In Acts 7, 48-49, it says, However, the Most High does not live in houses made of human hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hands made all these things? So again, he confronts idolatry, Stephen does. The temple became an idol. It became more important than Jesus. Now, Stephen applied this sermon to the listeners. And this is where he, some of that respect may be seen to go. He says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not perse persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. And you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. Can you imagine the angry whispers that must have been going on? I, I think probably as the Sanhedrin realized more and more that Stephen was talking about them, they became angry and anger. And he saw that they were not going to accept the, the message of Jesus Christ. So he calls them, um, them stiff-necked people. So where does this come from? Where's that word stiff-necked people? Well, it's, and let's look in Exodus 32.9. I've seen the people, the Lord says to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. The people referred to as stiff-necked almost 20 times in the Old Testament. These, uh, and these religious were being just like their forefathers. No change. In Jeremiah 9.26, it says, All the nations are already uncircumcised, and even the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in the heart. So Stephen leaves no doubt. He calls his religious leaders blasphemers of God, Moses, and the law. 
They were given the law, but they didn't keep it. They are no better than the Gentiles. Now, that was about as big as an insult that you could have by saying they were just as the uncircumstances. And because of that, here's an origin that lied, cheated, and murdered is now confronted with their sins. So how do they react when they're confronted with their sins? Well, not too well. It said, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. They lost all sense of root. They actually became a mob. They did not want to hear the truth. What they did was commit murder a second time. Now you hear the idea of gnashing their teeth could help but remind me the imagery of hell. Seven different times Jesus described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can see this example in Matthew 8, 12. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like the ungodly in Psalms 36, 16, like the ungodly, they maliciously mocked and they gnashed their teeth at me. In Psalms 37, 12, the wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. You know, it was against Roman law for the Jewish people to kill somebody. Uh, some says, well, you know, stoning was a part of their law, but everything I could find, it was illegal. Only killing, only, you know, they could only kill somebody. It was the, the Romans were the only ones who could kill somebody. But this didn't stop them. Why didn't it stop them? Well, Pontius Pilate was still in command, and he was a pretty weak governor. He didn't want to stir up problems. If the Sanhedrin wanted to kill somebody, keep a low key, he was okay with that. They, they did not worry about Pontius Pilate. At this time, they took Stephen outside the city. Why? Because in Leviticus 24, it says that anybody was to be stoned, they were to be done outside the city. Now, Deuteronomy says that the hand of the witness shall be the first upon him to put him to death. Afterwards, the hands of the people shall throw the stones. Now, according to the Mishnah, Jewish, the Jewish law, the drop of the stoning uh, place was twice the height of a man. So there was a pit somewhere probably 10 to 12 feet deep. And what they would do is the first witness would push the person who would be a stone off and he would drop 10 to 12 feet. They would drop him face first. Now, how he landed, I don't know, but they had to turn him over to look at his face. And they were doing this check to see if he was killed by the initial fall. If that didn't kill him, the next witness would take a big stone and drop it on his head. If that didn't kill him, then the whole congregation was a stone him. Now, we know from the verses that Stephen wasn't killed from the drop. He wasn't even killed from the first stone. If these guys were following the law, he was killed when the congregation began to throw stones. Uh, now, look what his dying words were, Stephen's dying words. He said, Lord, do not hold these sins against them. Basically, this is what Jesus said on the cross. Finally, in verse 58, we see the introduction of Saul, which we'll take up next week. Thank you for your time. Let's end with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for men like Stephen who understood the word and could express their defense of their faith in the word. We just ask that you would give us the, the knowledge, the encouragement to study your word to know that we too can defend our faith when asked. We just ask these things in your holy name. Amen.